All right then, so let's get started. Uh, everyone, thanks for joining us for our data engineering interviewing series, a workshop series uh, with Angie Mercian. I believe this is the second um, series where we will be working on advanced SQL. And there's a lovely photo of Anju. Uh, she's graduated from Syracuse University, New York with a master's degree in computer engineering. Uh, her previous work experience includes Intel for five years as an infrastructure engineer, VMware as a project manager, Intuitive Surgical as a business system analyst, and Odena as a platform engineer. And she is currently a data engineering consultant at Meta Facebook. And yeah, Anju, I'll hand the microphone over to you. Okay, um, so um, this is our second series. So we had the first series that was all about SQL, and we also had a little, a little bit of leftover from la, uh, from the last time. I know it's been like three weeks between. I'm sorry, I was sick last week, so I couldn't take um, I couldn't take the workshop last week. Uh, so, but for this week, we act, I actually wanted to not go with the same thing again, but start from where we left off. I think we left off with one of the questions. Um, this. I don't know. I think we finished this, but we left off with one of the questions. Um, this is a question we left left off with. I am planning on starting with this question, but does anybody, those who participated last week, do you have uh, last week, not last time, uh, that was almost like February 27th, three weeks back. If you have any questions, please do post your questions and uh, we can go over any questions that you may have. Or you went over, or even if you have any questions about the question that I shared, and you have anything, you can ask me. Um, if you need to know what happened previously, uh, Elisa has already shared a YouTube video of last week. It was mostly a SQL, and um, uh, we went over joins and the basics of SQL. Uh, we went over one question. This was the second question where we left. Um, this session, I want to go over window functions, the last part of SQL, which is advanced SQL, the window functions, and then I want to get into data modeling. Uh, data modeling is usually for data designing, uh, and the questions asked for the in, uh, for interviews will be, uh, many questions will be like designing uh, <clears throat> data models. So, and also one more thing I wanted to even previously, since we only have like one hour time and we can go a little more than one hour, um, I will be going over the theoretical concepts this week, all the definitions, what everything is, all the definitions. You see, my slides are very long with just the definitions of everything. And the next time, uh, that's uh, the practical, um, uh, we will go over a problem that we can work through with the concepts that we go over this week. Hopefully, nobody has any issues with that. Um, because I uh, just because the data uh, modeling concepts itself takes a long time to go over, and all these concepts are something we have to always remember, because based on these concepts is when how we'll create the the data modeling design. I uh, <clears throat> the last time I wanted to focus this question more mainly on joins and subqueries. So this question I selected in such a way that we have a. Um, a subquery and a join. So um, calculate each user's average session time. Okay. A session is defined as a time difference between a page load and a page exit. So each time a page is loaded and page is exited, that is one session time. Uh, for simplicity, I assume a user has only one session per day. And if there are multiple sessions of, of the same events on the same day, consider only the latest page page load, the latest page load and the latest earliest page exit. Okay. So if they go to the same, like for example, they go in Facebook, and many times a day you may go to Facebook, but the, the one session is only considered from the, the latest page load to the earliest page exit. Output of output the user ID and the average uh, session time. Um, so the table given is a Facebook web, web, web blog, okay, and here if you see what are the different columns available, the, the user ID, the timestamp and action are the columns, um, int, date, time, and var, uh, varcar are the, 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 the types, the data types, okay. So, uh, so with that, so they're asking us to find the, um, the, uh, the late, the page load and the page exit. So, so if you see, take that. If you 
see select star from the table Facebook for web underscore blog, right? We run the code. Okay, okay. So if you see the action will tell you whether it's a page load or a scroll down or a scroll up or a page exit. So basically what we need to do is, so basically what we need to do is for a particular session, we need to, <coughs> we need to like basically check the page load and the page exit for a session time. And also we are only having, we only have one sessions. Okay. So, um, so one session at a time. So if you see, you have the um, session ID, user ID here. So based on the user ID, so user ID zero, uh, user ID one, user ID two is there. So for this user ID zero, we have one page load. Okay, so we need to calculate the time from this page load to this page exit. Okay, so we need to find the, uh, the average session time. How long were they there on that particular page? They're scrolling up, they're scrolling down, all that is captured, but that's what we want. So first we have to, so what we have to do here is, first we have to calculate the, the time of the page loads. Then we have to get the times of the page exits. Then for every user, we need to take the average time. Okay, so that's what I have done here. So here I'm doing subqueries with a with clause, which actually basically I like it very much. It's very easy to compartmentalize uh, with the with clause. I'm taking the subquery. So first with one, I'm calculating all the page loads. So I'm doing with load as I'm mean, selecting the user ID. Uh, so this is the date timestamp. This actually is an inbuilt function for Postgres SQL. Um, how will you know this is you just look up online um, and once you are familiar with a particular uh, database like MySQL or Postgres, you will know they are, uh, most of them all, almost always have the same type of inbuilt functions and especially for daytime, those are always inbuilt. And this is something uh, that you should know, um, not by hearted, but kind of know it. Uh, Okay, uh, so um, so yeah, so these are all like uh, in inbuilt functions. But sometimes sometimes you need to um, know these functions. And this date time is um, is a function like that. So uh, date from the timestamp that they have, they're taking the day. So this basically the date function uh, splits the timestamp into day, date. You know, so if you just do date, then we find the date of the timestamp. You load the day, then then we're getting the maximum time load so that we are getting, so we are getting which day they loaded the maximum time and where the action is page load. So we're taking all the loads for a particular user, then all the uh, page exits for a particular user. And then we are joining those two, these two sub queries, and we are only getting the average time that they were on that particular page per user. So per user, we're getting the load time. So why we had to do this is we needed to get the latest page load and the earliest page exit. So that's why we're getting the maximum time over here for the, um, the, the load time. And here we're getting the minimum time for the load time. Okay. And then we are uh, using a left join and we are going to get the, um, the user ID and the average session time. Hopefully everybody understood this. <clears throat> if you have any questions, please ask in the Q&A. That is for that um, question. Now, uh, now we'll go into a uh, SQL window functions. So the, uh, what is a SQL window function? So SQL window functions, like the name suggests, it, uh, it helps break at the background. It helps break a particular um, table into uh, windows, into window sessions. So that, so like, for example, if you're taking a sum of a table for sum of salaries, most of the time you will take some of the whole, the, the background when you do the sum, 
uh, sum of, usually it'll take the whole table as is, as a whole, and it'll take the sum of the whole table and give it to you. But what if you want like a sum over kind of a partition, sum of salaries based on the designation of the person, like whether the person is a software engineer or a data engineer or a data scientist, how will you do that? So window functions will come in handy. So you can, with the use of window functions, you can break apart a particular table and be, uh, you can break apart over, like you can say partition by partition over uh, the designation or the job title, the partition by job title and take the sum of salaries. So you, so the only thing you have to use is instead of doing sum of salaries, here is something like sum of uh, sum uh, over partition by job title of salaries. So you get uh, by salaries, you get the sum of all the sum of average, average is better for salaries, so average of the salaries. So based on, so this window functions help break down a table into particular windows and uh, calculate over time. And usually window functions will uh, come in handy when you want to rank something or rate something. And uh, when you want to, um, something is changing all the time like you want to get some running totals and you want to that changes running profits which usually changes so though uh, so you can use rank functions or window function to help get that information right you know over a particular time frame or over a particular partition you can get the uh, uh, what is that the the sum or the data or the rank of that that's how window functions are used so for example, here itself, if you see you're taking the average salary, this is an example of a window function. How you know it's, it's a window function is you, you by using the word over or this over, and then after that you have, um, you either need to have over and in parentheses have order by or partition by for us to, um, uh, for, for the, system or the background backend to know it is whether it's a window function or not. If you just use average salary, it will count it as a regular aggregate function. So here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the um, average salaries per the department. So by developer, uh, different personnel by sales. So, <clears throat> so here we're doing average salary over partition by debt name from the M cell from the table. So what this does is back in the, at the back, uh, back end, it will partition by the job title or the department name. And then based on the job title, it will average out and give you the um, average, average salaries for the particular uh, department name, particular job title. And you don't have to like, you know, do, if suppose if you had to do this in like a procedure, uh, procedural algorithm uh, type of code, you'd be like, if department name is so-and-so, then take the average of, their salaries. So instead of that, instead of having to do that that many long, thus the over by function itself does it for you. So this is the easy function we have over here. Okay. Um, yeah, this is the same thing uh, for, uh, so that's what, um, here I'm just emphasizing the fact that window functions are like, the word says window, it breaks up a particular table into particular partitions, um, partitions or um, yeah, particular partitions and you can base the average or rank based on that partitions. That's that's wonderful function we have in Windows. And uh, this window functions joins and subqueries are usually most of the time asked in interviews. Basically, they won't just ask you this. It like in a particular, um, the code in the code you have this um, you have to use this ranking and stuff like that so the and these questions are more are mostly asked these are kind of like tough to think about so they want to try and figure out if you're really good at SQL language to know this so different types of window functions that are available is row number rank dense rank and entire entire we hardly used we just but row number and rank number. So row number, rank number is basically it will <clears throat> the it will uh, the the window function will uh, order the uh, the whole table into rows into different type of row numbers. So it'll rank the or it'll uh, uh, what is that? It'll place row numbers to every uh, uh, every row based on your ask. 
okay so it will give you a particular row number 1 2 3 rank will basically will say based on suppose the same page uh, page session right so who uh, if you take the average page session time it will rank and say okay this is the most average session time so this is rank 1 rank 2 so basically rank is as the word goes it will rank you as first second third you know kind of a thing uh, so uh, <clears throat> dense rank is actually the only difference between dense rank and rank is how the duplicate values are assigned so if you have duplicate values in dense uh, dense rank it will assign it a different value but in rank it will have send the same value so if if two of them have the same average salary if two departments have the same average salary it rank it as two if it's the second rank second highest then it'll just say two if it is third highest it'll like say 3 3 uh, 3 3 3 but if it's dense rank it'll say 3 4 5 you know that's that's the difference between dense rank and rank uh, even the even the duplicates will be ranked amongst themselves itself now entire uh, entire function is uh, actually i've never used entire so this is uh, this is just theoretical for me too uh function to distribute the number of rows and specify n number of groups so basically um how many of groups are there it will group it for you and say okay this is group 1 this group 2 group 3 that's how it will uh, rank for you okay uh, if you need more read on that uh, when i share this uh, presentation i have a source file here and this is a nice a nice uh, link that i have found where i always go to to for to understand window functions a little more okay so now it's question time if there's anybody interested in wanting to do this question uh, you know you can go ahead or if you want to do it later uh, and want to just discuss it in the slack we can discuss it on slack and we can just go into the concepts of data modeling now i think ban okay ban was asked a question can we have demo of with those functions demo with the window functions ban if it is demo of the window functions i can show you here itself in this question right you know the answer is coming up because i solve the problems the answer keeps coming up uh so if you see over here i have rank by uh i don't know let me delete that and um, one second i'll Can I can share. So, no, I thought you took it out. Session. Sorry, that is not. Okay. So in this, I will demonstrate rank function for you here. So here, the question is: You have been asked to find job titles of the highest paid employees. Okay. So, um, high. Uh, so uh, you output should include highest paid employees multi or multiple titles for the same salary. So here, they are asking us to get the highest paid employees. So in, in this highest paid employees, you can always do it as uh, ranking, right? So basically, it is ranking. You are ranking which um, uh, a job title has the highest. okay uh which job title has the highest uh, salary so i'll just do the rank function and i can also do the uh, so i'll say uh, okay first i'll do what is in the work 
So in the worker uh, table, you have the columns, worker ID, first name, last name, salary, joining date department. And in the title, you have a uh, worker, worker ID. So basically worker ID will be the primary key and uh, worker reference ID. And here is this worker ID, that's the primary key for that table. And you have a worker title and affected from. So here, let's rank this here, okay? So here we are ranking it. And here we'll select, uh, we'll, so where does the rank high, so the salary comes in the, uh, the workers table. So from the workers table, from the workers table, what I need is based on the salary, I need to rank it. So I will rank it, I'll just select the worker ID, then, do the salary, then I'll do rank function. So I'll rank the salary over, okay, I'm ranking over, so I use the, uh, use the name rank over uh, order by salary, okay. And here I'm just going to put as ranking. So to give an alias and give a, um, to give a name for that, okay? So I'm just going to run this code. So if you see here, so, I, so I'm, I'm just ranking the salaries to find out which is the highest salary, okay? So in this, say, if you see what I get is um, uh, 500,000, is for worker ID four, 500,000 he gets as the highest. There's no department name. Oh, there's department two. So I'll do department. Oh, no, wait, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so basically when you're admin, you have uh, the, the ranking is like one. So if you see, I just use rank instead of dense rank. So I'm getting one, one. Let's see what happens when you do. It's not identifying dense rank. Yeah, some things don't identify dense rank since I'm using that. Okay. But if you use dense rank, this will be one, two per based on that. Mm, and uh, oh, if I, if I wanted instead of doing, I can do order by salary, but I can also do partition by Okay, so when I partition my department, so what it'll do is based on the department, it'll rank. So this accountant has two different types of salaries and two accountants are getting the same salary. So the, uh, the, uh, the two accountants are getting only 75,000, one accountant is getting two, 200,000 and they are, it's ranking based on that, based on departments. And then that is like one window. Now you have another window of admin, right? Uh, so there's like, Okay, so uh, so when you're doing when it does the duplicate, it skips one rank. So this is a wonderful example of showing that here it will skip three if there was a third different um, uh, salary, but here it skipped two because there's like over there one missing uh, because the difference between this and this is high. So it it will take two off. You know, if you see over here, there's two one, so it took two off. Here there's two three, so it took four off. Okay, and so if you see, if you can, you can clearly see the windows, the different windows, right? So department is like one particular window it's taken and amongst that window, it is doing the ranking. And over here, uh, admin is a different window and amongst that it is doing a ranking, right? Uh, does anybody have any question? Do, uh, hopefully you understood this. <laughs> if anybody didn't understand, please ask questions or if you want me to repeat it again, let me know. But if you want to go in depth and ask more questions, you can actually contact me on Slack and we can discuss this further. I would be very happy. So highest paid, had a highest paid rank is one. So here, so, so I get the ranks. Then here I'm filtering out based on the first rank. Um, uh, and, but I'm also doing, they're getting, asking for the title, highest paid title. So I'm getting the title from the title column, uh, title table. I'm getting the title from the title table. 
and uh, I'm getting that. Okay, so this is what I'm getting. Now, uh, and if you see, my output will be the title is assistant manager and managers are the top uh, position, top highest paid. They get the rank one. So that is where the title is that. So Matt has asked a good question. I saw this question a while ago without using the window function. Is it better to use window functions if possible? Actually, to showcase that you know SQL very well, using window functions is always better, Max. Uh, Matt, sorry. Um, um, so yeah, because window functions are like an advanced SQL, so to showcase that uh, you have good working knowledge, it'll be good. Sometimes um, they will themselves will say, um, do you think you can use window function? Do you think you can do something else to this code? Do you think you can make this code better? And that time you can think of window functions. Like if you so you think of a, see a question and you're able to solve it without using window functions, rank functions, and you solve it, but then they look at the code and they go, hey, do you think you can make it better? Then you can use window functions. Or, uh, or the first itself, you can start using window functions. I know many enthous enthusiastic in interview solvers would be like, they'll just jump into like window, uh, window functions, they jump into like uh, joins and SQL queries to showcase that they have skill. Too much enthusiasm also, they may get irritated, but it's always, sometimes they may ask you. So, but using window functions is always the better way to solve. Uh, if, you, if, if you can think of a solution in window functions, not everything can be solved in window functions, but if you think of a solution, but if you don't think of it, don't, you don't have to break ahead because they'll ask you. They may, they may, they'll question you again. Hey, can you make it better? This may get boring. I'm very sorry. This is all theory. It's going to be theory, and I'll get into more demo session next week. I promise. <laughs> But I want to go with the concepts instead of confusing everybody because I don't know how many beginners or how many uh, intermediates are there who already know the concepts. Uh, if you know the concepts, it may get uh, boring. Um, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that the concepts are well ingrained before we move on to solving a problem based on that. Okay. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to go with the data modeling. So even before getting into the definition of data modeling, let's go over certain other definitions, okay? A lot of definitions. Um, <clears throat> there are different types of processing of data. Uh, there's like uh, 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 the OLAP, which is online analytical processing. There's o OLTP, which is online transaction processing and data lakes. Data lakes is relatively new. Uh, previously, if you see uh, before all of this data science and ML craze happened, Data, data lakes was not the major thing. With AWS and GCP is when we have these data lakes and everything. But before that, it was always like, whether you are using an OLAP or an OLTP, OLTP. So what is an OLAP? OLAP is online analytical processing. Basically, uh, online processing and uh, OLTP is online transactional processing. So if when you're going to Safeway or any of these big store or any store and you're buying stuff, right? So you're buying your groceries and you are scanning it. Uh, so when you're scanning it, all the, the product and the price comes up, right? On your, uh, wherever you're scanning it and they give you the total. That's basically transactional processing. So that is also a database, but it's all the transactions that you're doing. So every customer that comes in, whatever they buy, all the processing that happens, that's transactional. Now, all of this data actually goes back into a data warehouse to, for, for the analysis. Like uh, how many customers bought salt today or how many customers are buying which product, which is the most, um, um, uh, which is the best product, like in Amazon, you have like, which is the product, which is the best seller and all that stuff, right? So that is basically going to analytical uh, processing that goes into a warehouse. So that is where on, uh, online analytical processing comes in. Then data lakes is where unstructured structures data is all dumped in. It's just a dump, like the name says, it's just a lake with everything that's in there. Then you can just pull it out and uh, use it. Uh, but many people think like from the data lakes, you can actually get your structure. You can just get your tables and everything. But sometimes from the data lakes, you may have to take it out and clean the data. And that's where data engineers usually come in is once so Amazon will have a data lake, right? All of the data, all of our transaction process, analytic process, everything is going to that data lake and it will be up to a data engineer or data analyst behind the scenes to take that data and make sense of it. Like create structured tables from the unstructured data or from the unstructured data itself find, uh, find different things, right? 
So that is a data lake. Just as name it says, if you think of data lake, it's just a, like a pond of stuff of data. Um, why these definitions I am, so I am bringing it here as important is because when you are designing a data modeling um, design, you have to think of it from that, this perspective. Are you creating a data lake? Or are you creating an analytical system? Right? So is it just going to be a warehouse or is it going to be a transaction? You know, those are some of the questions you have to ask um, when you are given a question like this. Like uh, the question that I'm actually going to give you, uh, we're going to work on is a daycare system, okay? Daycare management system. So there's a daycare management, uh, a daycare teacher or daycare management comes to you and asks you, hey, um, uh, 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 hey, uh, can you help uh, create uh, um, a, a database management system for me? So these are some of the questions you ask, whether you have to ask, well, what are you going to do with this data? Like, how do you want to help, or how do you want us to help you with this data? So that is when you'd, you have to figure out whether you're going to create an analytical system or a transactional system. So in an analytical system, analytic system is mostly for, uh, is going to be optimized for complex analytics uh, ad hoc queries including aggregations right most of the sums and all the, uh, the aggregations happen in a analytic system and this analytic system is actually different from a transaction system when you build it itself because analytic system must be a uh, re, uh, read heavy okay it should be uh, it'll be uh, sorry quick reads it'll be quick reads okay um, uh, it should be created in such a way that they can e easily get that information so when you build your table build your columns in the table uh, build your uh, schema database schema if it is an analytic system the way you must pro provide it to the end customer or the who the end user is it must be make sure that it's um, uh, for, uh, optimized for the reads it's like a data warehouse, a digital support database uh, that has extensive history. Now, a transaction system must be optimal for fast writes. So when you're processing any transactions, it must be quick, right? You're not going to wait for an hour and say, hey, just for your transaction system to give you your, uh, how much you have to pay, right? You want to, it must go quickly. It must immediately process. So this is for fast write. Now, data lakes, Larry has asked a question. So are data lakes designed for fast writes? So data lakes is, Yes, it's it is for fast writes. Uh, data lakes is designed for fast writes so that um, uh, all the information is collected. We're not losing any information, and yes, so fast writes. That's what is use, used for. So a data lake is a centralized repository that allows you to store all the structured and unstructured data at scale. You can store your data assets without having to first structure the data. So basically, here in the OLAP and OLTP, you have to structure the data. Uh, to to be able to process it, right? So uh, like if you see the transactional system, it, it'll always have like item number, purchase item name, uh, rate, right? And then it'll give you some. So that has to be always followed. But there are sometimes you can't follow those sessions, right? Like any management system is built, if you're, they're usually built with these columns that are there. But sometimes you can't just, you want to collect more metadata, right? You may want to collect uh, something about that, like uh, the type of food or something more uh, data, and you do really don't have a column to place it in. That's also where data lakes comes into play, right? Nowadays, not only data is useful, but the metadata, the metadata of that is useful, right? So these days, this data lakes are becoming very, very important to us. So um, those are three different, those are the definitions. So that is something you have to remember when designing. Now let's start with some basics here. So the, when you're creating a database management system, what is actually followed when creating a database management system is always based on these COBS 12 rules, okay? The 12 rules are as here, you know, the information rule, the, the sorry, foundation rule information. So when you build a database management system, um, these rules are usually followed by many companies, like the asset properties are followed. These rules are followed. Uh, to build your um, database, and for a, to create a data model, the, our, the the most important rule is this information. For us, the rule number one, the information rule is actually the most important rule. Uh, so, Larry asks, do we have to consider consistency if on a distributed database? Uh, when you say consistency, um. Okay. Uh, what do you mean by uh, consistently, like consistently taking all the data, Larry? Uh, can you just uh, 
elaborate on your question a little bit? Andrew, maybe you can zoom in a bit. It's a bit small yeah. to read on the screen. Otherwise, I know you'll be sharing uh, slides after the presentation too. Yeah, yeah. Sure, please. <laughs> Wait one second. Uh, I don't know, for some reason, this is not, I think, uh, because this is a screenshot. This, yeah, uh, this is a screenshot. Like for rights to co uh, commit to all copies of the distribution. Oh, right, right, right. Uh, for, um, Yes, consistency is always important for any database creation. If it's data lakes or uh, transactional analytical, consistency is very important. That's like the, the asset properties, right? Atomicity, consistency. Um, I should have written the asset properties. I'll make sure to write that before I share this. Um, but yes, uh, yes, always for database, consistency is key. Uh, when you go with normal forms, we will see that consistency is key um, for everything. When you're creating a database. So if you're even creating for distributed database, you need to make sure there's consistency. Okay, so these are the rules. I just wanted to like the, this this slide, these slides are here, the, these two slides are here, just to uh, make a note that we need to remember that how these database little um, management the relation database management systems are created because these rules are important for us to remember whenever we are creating a, a data database, right? even like as a data engineer or in data scientist, these rules are all important when creating it. Uh, these rules are actually very old rules. It's not new rules. These are how even before a DBA or DBM, uh, DBA was using, uh, even a database administrator from, uh, from 2008, I think they were using it. So these were the rules that we used to build. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting it here. You don't have to remember all the 12 rules, but you need to know that, that these rules exist. At least go over them and just remember these rules exist when we are creating database. And But the rule number one, the information rule, that is all information in a related database is represented explicitly at the logical level and in exactly one way by values in tables. That is uh, the foundation for our creating database management system. Now, <clears throat> Yeah, these may be evenings. Uh, okay, so what is a database schema? A database schema defines how data is organized within a relation database. This is um, this is inclusive of logical constraints such as table names, fields, data types, and the relationship between entities. Basically, one to one to one relationship or one to many relationship are all in this database schema. How it's referenced, right? And what is a database? A database is an organized collection of structured information or information or data typically stored electronically in a computer science. I just want to write this. So what is a database? What are we creating? Is an organized collection of data, okay? Now, um, we also have NoSQL, Apache Cassandra, right? The NoSQL databases. Uh, usually in interviews, what is happening is uh, they're not focusing most, more on NoSQL databases. Um, they are focusing on relation databases. Even if they, the behind the scenes, they will end up using a NoSQL. Uh, but keep it, keeping relational database ideas in mind when de when developing a data model is very very important. That's why here everything is based on relation databases. And you think, oh, why why can't we use NoSQL? You can use NoSQL. But when designing a database as a database engineer for uh, for anybody, uh, for anybody, you must make sure that you follow these rules. So one, you'll be able to give the customer what they need, right? You it'll be easy for us to think through, uh, design carefully, and do it. it. It doesn't matter whether you're going to use a NoSQL database or a relation database. The designing process must, if it follows these rules, it'll be very helpful. Um, in in using our uh, our resources efficiently, in using our resources efficiently, so that's why we're following the related databases um, schema and what is it? Okay, now ER diagram. So uh, why I'm talking about ER diagram is when you're designing it, you don't code, uh, you don't start coding at all. Like uh, when we are uh, designing a database, even in interviews, we don't start immediately coding. As soon as they say, okay, this is your question, you don't go immediately into uh, writing queries or writing uh, writing anything. You are first going to discuss with your interviewer what it means. So you're going to first discuss what the question is, what are they ask, and this ER diagram will help you 
uh, get the information. So yeah, diagram is nothing but an entity relationship diagram, a way to show the different relationship between various entities and a data model. Okay, so the, uh, the entities are represented as rectangles. I'll, show. I'll draw it for you. I found a draw online where I can draw it. Okay. Usually when I uh, draw, when I draw a relation entity diagrams is how I do it. So, so my, forgive my non straight lines. So this is like one entity. Okay. So for example, uh, uh, like for example, uh, a sales, uh, we are doing some uh, 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 sales, for example, wait me one second. I have that. Okay, let's do a, so let's do a crime database, okay? So a crime housing database here. In this, so um, you're, you are looking for a house and you're looking to see how the crime in the neighborhood is, right? So what are the different tables that we need here? So I will have like a, a different tables like crime table um, and um, uh, housing, the house details table and, you know, um, uh, weather details, for example. So this will be like one table. So table one, the crime table. Sorry, for my, right? So this is one entity. This is an entity, okay? The, the, this is an entity, the crime table, that's an entity. Now attributes will usually be your columns here. And then for example, then you'll have another entity, another basically another table. That entity is nothing but the table. And then you have columns underneath. And then for example, housing, right? house details, okay? You have your house details here. So this is another uh, entity, um, another entity table. Now what will be the uh, relationship between house and crime? So usually there'll be a relationship with one to many. So for one house district, there may be crimes, many crimes around the neighborhoods and you need all the crime details. So you'll have like one, so this will be like one to many. This is how you draw a one to many relationship like this. Okay, and like this. This would be like one to many relationship. If it is a one to one relationship, uh, for example, weather. Okay. Uh, okay, weather. Now, weather for the particular area will be like one to one relationship. So you just have like one and one. Right. So you have that one on one relationship. Um, can show you different. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and start logging in your questions right now if you would like. I'll show you different QR diagrams that I have drawn um, in the past. Wait, I have drawn a few, like a few ER diagrams in the past. I on internet I use uh, uh, this uh, diagrams.net um, to draw my diagrams. Draw I draw IO that I use that to draw ER diagrams. So usually like the same, uh, the table that I have shown, like uh, many to many relationship, or this is all many to many, this is, uh, this is also many to many, but usually you can also have one to many relationships. Then um, I also have one of my projects, my final project for my data engineering. I have drawn a uh, ER diagram like this. I did an immigration table and you have like this one to many relationship, you know, one to many relationship like that. This is all one to many because I created a fact and dimension table so I made one to many relationship. Um, so this is uh, uh, an entity diagram that I have drawn. Now, what is PK and FK and I'll come to that. Uh, this is primary key and um, foreign key. 
but this is a good representation of how uh, you can think through a problem and create all this so uh, so uh, the, I, i'm giving you definitions for all this so that we can when we are drawing our data model for data modeling you we will have this in mind so this is what an entity relationship diagram is all about you know this is how you draw your entity relation di diagrams here itself and and you actually do this on the job because i do this on my job especially when i'm when i'm not uh, not every day but right now i'm working on a project where i have to create everything from scratch and this entity relationship diagram is something i'm drawing for documentation sake uh, so that anybody else that comes after me to this job they will know exactly what my thought process are what my what the uh, that, uh, the tables i created and what are the relationship between tables it's always easier to look at a picture and go like hey okay this is what uh, they were thinking this is the relationship that they have so i am actually doing this on the job so this is very important <laughs> just because i am not because i am doing it but i think every data engineer is doing it so even data engineers in my company are doing it uh, for documentation right <clears throat> so it helps us all think through what are the different relationships the tables will have and uh, what are the different entities what are the different columns because like for example you're taking data from a data lake right and it's unstructured data and you have to structure the data so you will take from different columns and you'll then place it like in a staging a staging environment that's that may be your tables so you need to know uh, from these tables i took all this and put it into um this information so uh, you can already have like crime and housing details put it all together or different housing details from different unstructured tables bring it all together structure it and then have uh, in a relationship so you will know like okay these are the tables i got the data from so these unstructured tables i'll get the data from and create the structured table housing right uh, it may be from different like from zillow you may take housing information red from it housing information then you'll just match the data and then put it into your own housing table that is the structured data you're creating so how exactly you're getting that you can actually draw it as an er diagram for documentation you know and keep that um i had asked a question uh not a question but someone sequel clients db server for example will allow you to view er diagrams for existing tables and schemas yeah 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 uh, so if you are working and but this i'm talking from the interview perspective matt so that's why i'm going over the, all this uh, but yes uh, sometimes on, online uh, in some companies they will all they have something that they can draw out of yeah but but, but not in the conceptual stage you know <laughs> like when you have created the tables uh only once you created the tables you'll get that back end uh, uh that many to many relationship and all that between the tables uh, we even we have uh, like we will give you back end but when you are in the conceptual stage sometimes you'll have to draw this and uh, when you're talking to other data engineers or something you need to do an er diagram uh larry is asked do you have any tips or tricks to determine the relationships between entities it's hard to determine if something is one to one one to many like in the design stage so a design stage is usually an iterative process larry like um, there is something we you when you're talking to, if suppose this is a question that you're asking in the interview how to figure it out that will be something that you will have to talk to your interviewer about you can't you may not be directly able to ask but you can say i'm thinking this will be one to many because of this reason or you can also directly ask so uh, um, what do you uh, you can ask you can it can be a conversational thing and ask okay so um but it should be a very dumb question you know sometimes like um like in this question question here are house to crimes usually for one house uh, one house uh, you can either be one to many or many to many because for many houses all the many crimes that is happening you can say but sometimes they themselves will tell you um uh, oh no i think one to many should be fine it's not such a big database it's not that much of data um you know uh, that time you can be like if it's not too much data then usually like one to many one to one one to many will go or there'll be a logical connection you know um between one to one one to many but if you're doing it in like a company if you ask me like a project in a company then that will be a iterative process that Uh, you know first you design then you think oh it's one to many then you're like no 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 okay maybe it's many to many uh, because we have the new figure out okay oh there are many things that are connecting to many things here um 
you look at the data and then say, oh, okay, so we'll have to do many, many connections from here are there too many connections. So it will, it is usually an iterative process. This actually data modeling itself is an iterative process. You keep changing it. But once you come to the code stage, hopefully it is the final, you know, or maybe not, <laughs> sometimes it's the final, but in an interview setting, you can always talk to the, the these will be some of the questions that you ask the interviewer to, to keep the conversation going and uh, understanding more in depth of what they are thinking. So you can talk to the um, <clears throat> interviewer and ask. Okay. So um, here, let's talk about the keys. If there are any questions, please go ahead. Uh, the, the the different keys here this primary key uh the different keys we have is uh primary key foreign key and then there's composite keys composite keys is basically you have two columns that will make up um your uh, your primary key that's actually what composite key is because sometimes one column may not be enough to make that unique you may not be unique enough um so how do i say uh um Usually, okay, let me do. Uh, so a primary key is an attribute, a group of attributes that uniquely identify one instance. So basically, if you see the workers table or the title table that we looked at in the question right now, um, the worker ID is a unique key. Usually, like when you go into a company, you they will get a company employee ID. That's a usually a unique key. Uh, so that will be a primary key. And what is a foreign key? Foreign key is something that is used to connect to another table. So even if you have like, um, you have a title table and you have a worker, worker table, in the title table, title ID can be a primary key saying that, okay, the, a particular department title has this ID, but in, within that ID, there'll be a worker ID, which is actually the primary key of the workers table. So workers table has workers details with their based on their worker ID and title stable has title ID based on the job title. But one job, uh, one title can be given to one worker ID can be have the, uh, can be connected to the worker table as a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And uh, the worker ID can be, a, it will be a foreign key in the title, title uh, table. It'll connect as a foreign key to the title table. Uh, that is the foreign key. So when you're connecting to another table, based on an ID, that, that key in that other table will be the foreign key, okay? So, yeah, so rule one, information rule is the important for data modeling to remember. Mm, so then we, I said uh, composite key for primary keys is um, basically like, for example, job title and uh, name. Job title and name can kind of become a unique key uh, if you don't have a worker ID. For example, if you don't have a worker ID, then job title and um, or job title um, designation, something a like senior junior title promo or ID or and your name can become one um, uh, a one entity that will be a primary key to identify you if your worker ID is one out there. That's kind of composite key. So you take two two to three different uh, column and make it one make it a key that will be composite key and they will be act as primary key or act as a primary key only. Okay, uh, we'll go into normalization. So what is normalization? Uh, the process of structuring relational database in accordance with a series of normal forms in order to reduce data redundancies and increase data integrity. Okay, so uh, that is the process of normalization to make it's basically to make sure that uh, there's no too many duplicate data duplicates, and then the data that so the the data uh, the, the data so when you are when you are qu querying the database the answer that you get back must be the right answer must be the correct answer so how, how much does this house cost you are asking the database uh, Redfin database it, it must give you the right answer it must, that must be consistent that's data integrity. So objects of normal form. What are, why do we have normal forms? It's to make sure that the, uh, the database is free of unwanted insertions, updates, and deletions to reduce the need for refactoring the database as new types of data are introduced, to make the relational models more informative to users, to make the database neutral to query statistics. Okay, These are the reasons why we have to make sure the database tables are normalized. Okay, uh, now there are different normal forms. Uh, the different way to, ways to do uh, normalization on the table, basically. 
there are actually six normal forms, but there are only three used, yeah, three used in production most of the time. Uh, the rest are usually used for research purposes and in academia and stuff like that. Uh, that's what they say. That's what even I've seen in, in person. But I don't know if there's anybody else that's using it. You know, you can share your experience. But uh, that was third, three, no, third normal form is the most, that is always the most that you go to. Okay, so what is the first normal form? In the first normal form, we have to make sure that each cell must have unique and single values. That's atomic values. Uh, be able to add data without altering tables. Okay, separate different relationships into different tables. For example, sales details and sales table, <coughs> customer details and customers table. And uh, keep relationship between tables with foreign keys, right? That's how you do the first normal form. Now to get second normal form, first you have to have reached the first normal form. And then uh, in the second normal forms, that's what they says. These are basically rules to make sure uh, that a particular table is normalized, okay? Uh, so these you follow these to make sure a particular table is normalized. And when you're designing your data models also, these are some things you must, uh, you, you, you don't have to do this as a checklist, but this should be behind your head to make sure, okay, all the values are atomic, okay? Like uh, sometimes you write, um, address will be like, the whole address will be the, uh, the, the street name, the, uh, the city, the, the country, and all that will be there. So that is too much of an information on a table. It's not good to have such big of an, uh, the, the table because it will be, you won't get the actual information. So that's why in the, like in the first normal form, second normal form, what they're asking is break that up, break that address up into smaller values. So what is the door number? What is the street name? What is your city? What's your country? Yeah, and what's its zip code? So having it all in one address line, break it up and make sure that it is in smaller atomic values so that when more information comes in. So for example, sometimes, you know, like in India and all, we have like long street, like two, three street names or something like that. So, uh, but in the U, in the in US, it'd be a different street names. But in Amazon and all, you are, you are well, Amazon has Amazon India, but for example, site not like Amazon, but has only one particular information. You need to make sure that the data that's being collected is collecting in smaller chunks. So that when more information comes in, those, those table values shouldn't be altered. We can't keep going into the database and keep altering those tables. We have to make sure that the tables are small enough and atomic enough that you don't have to change the database table in a long time. And or until the product is available, until the information is available, the table is available. You can't keep changing the tables too many times. That causes inconsistencies and the, you, the data integrity will not be followed sometimes and data duplication may happen. So that's why we have to have follow these rules when we are creating tables, right? And then all columns in the table must rely on primary key. <clears throat> so a third novel form, you, all uh, tables that we create must reach this form from our perspective as a data engineer for data engineering interview, we must make sure that um, third normal form is reached, okay? So must be in the second normal form. There should not be any transitive dependencies. What's a transitive dependency is if A uh, associates with B and B associates with C, uh, examples of functional dependencies, then A to C is called a transitive dependency. So A is related to B, B is related to C, and A is related to C because of B. That's transitive dependencies. And that dependency must not be there. Okay, that's what we're saying. So as, as I said previously, there are six novel forms, only three are used in production, three, three enough, and only till three enough. And as data engineers, we must make sure that our table, when we're designing that uh, our table data is in three enough, has to be in three enough. It can't be in just one enough and two enough. It has to be in third enough. Okay. Now, denormalization. Now I told you how to build normalization. And I'm telling you, let's denormalize it. Uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> that's that's also needed. The process of trying to improve the read performance of a database at the expense of losing some write performance by adding redundant, redundant copies of data. So like, uh, like um, uh, somebody had just asked the question right now. Uh, 
uh, Glary, I think. Glary asked the question, right? Why do we have um, the data lakes? Uh, the data lakes must be consistent or not. Um, sometimes when you have like distributed systems, we may, in, in order to give our um, reads, uh, faster reads, uh, we have to like distribute data. And sometimes uh, you have to denormalize data. Right, and the that is something you you may have because of distributed database or because of any performance issues. So uh, reads will be faster and writes will be slower. Data must be kept consistent. Okay, even though we are doing a denormalization, uh, we denormalize tables when there are many joins that need to happen to get the data. Uh, joints are very flexible, but slow, slow on the reads. Thus, in order for the reads to be faster, the data can be denormalized. Uh, and this happens in, in companies and regularly this happen. When you're a data engineer and you're working for companies, right? You will see that uh, this is happening a lot. Um, you will see one huge table, but that may be very slow to take, get your data. So then you have to like, um, you have to create another table from that table, which you may think is not necessary, but for some queries, it may be necessary. But uh, but this table, that table must have da consistent data. At the end of the day, that both the tables must have the consistent data, but uh, one table can have uh, uh, data for faster reads. <clears throat> because sometimes when you create dashboards, and you're using a huge table, and you're trying to query from the table, it is it takes a long time and usually you don't want your upper management to have to like wait through uh, that table and wait through and like log in. They want the answers quick and especially in their presentations or anything, you know, you, they can't just keep loading and that will irritate people, right? Um, so that time you should that time you can have something that's an example i'm giving you you can have like a denormalized data to satisfy those queries for this particular dashboard okay for the for particular dashboard like denormalize it take the information just for those reads um <clears throat> Now, uh, why I brought this concept out here is sometimes in the interviews they could ask you like, where do you uh, can can you uh, so I'm I, I have a dashboard it's taking too long to load how can you help me um, give can give me better um, performance on this so that you mean okay we can do one thing we can have this table and then we can normalize denormalize this table get more information here only pull out the information that we need for the queries for this dashboard denormalize it and keep it over here. Um, uh, so that only for this dashboard, this can be updated. But uh, but at the end of the day, the data will be consistent because this data will be uploaded even if it takes time and that data will be uploaded quickly. So this will be, so that's what you're talking about. Okay. Now, okay. So now we come to fact and dimensional tables. So there are two types of tables that we can, we can create for our data models. One is a fact table, one is a dimensional table. So what is a fact table? So fact table is a structure that, that categorizes to facts and measures in, in order to enable uh, users to answer business questions. Dimensional tables are people, products, and time. Dimension tables answers the questions what, where, and when. So for example, if you have a store sales database, the dimensional table will be where the product was bought, uh, when the product was bought, what product was bought. The fact table would be how many units of the product was bought. So facts uh, that you can give the actual factual numbers. How old are you? You know. Uh, what year is this? These are not facts. So those will be kind of in the usual year, age, and all will be in the fact table. Uh, price of the house, uh, price of the house and it's bought. Uh, those would be all in the fact table. And all the other details, if you're taking a house, like where it's located, the address, uh, all that will be in the um, uh, dimensional table. <clears throat> So fact and dimension tables work together to create an organization model. Why I'm talking about fact and dimension tables here is when you're creating a data model, we must it'll be very good for us to break it down to fact and dimensional tables uh, for us to give, uh, we'll talk about schemas in some time, for us to give a good data model design, okay? Uh, we're coming to schema. So there's two different schemas that we can use. Star schema and snowflake schema. I think there's a, there's a company snowflake itself that, that goes in depth into snowflake, um, snowflake schema. 
but these are the two schemas. We have star schema and snowflake schema. So star schema is basically, like the name says, it says it's in the star, star design. So you have one fact table where all the facts are there, and then you have dimension tables around. Why we do this fact and dimension table is a faster reads, and um, sometimes for, for faster reads. So if you are doing a, a transaction system, a system that needs faster reads, you do like a star schema that from the fact table you can get um, the the dimensional uh, in, the information and put it out there. Okay. So this is hopefully you can hunt it. This is good. Uh, it's a representation because there's nothing more to see on this. It's like it's in the star format. You break it down to fact dimension table. It's basically so it to help us read and write more efficiently. That's why all these schemas and architectures are given is to help you figure out what is the best way to architect a data a, a database so that depending on what the user wants you can um, create so whether you want an analytical system or a transaction system or a data lake or most of the time it's analytical transaction system what do you want so based on that you can design your architecture so if you have a star schema um, you know, your uh, writes will be faster. Uh, reads will all, because depending on the data, the, 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 enough information, reads will also be good. Um, so you can design it like this. Um, okay. Then the benefits of the star, the stars benefits, the drawbacks, the benefits of the stars, the data can be de denormalized, um, simplifies queries fast aggregations like count and group by. Drawback is issues that come with denorm data denormalization, data integrity, sometimes the data integrity is questioned, but it depends on how you build the database and how much control you have over the database. Then decrease query flexibility, many to many relationships are simplified. Okay. Uh, snowflake schema, as the name goes, snowflake schema, it's actually, uh, like a snowflake, it will be uh, instead of uh, so as the name goes, it will be like snowflake. So you have like one, there's one fact table. You have one fact table, then you have dimension table, dimension table, dimension table, dimension, or or fact table, fact table. Then you have another. Which, which if 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 anything is scheming out of this will be a fact table. There's a fact table, then you have another set of tables that's coming out of here, and then you know another set of tables coming out of here. So basically, how the, the representation is, right? So basically, you have you have a lot of information and you are trying to like atom atomicity to atomicize that table, bringing into smaller, um, uh, smaller chunks consumable chunks and but that will happen only when you keep breaking it down that's where snowflake schema comes into handy okay um you break down the fact table into different my dimensional tables or different fact tables and that fact table is broken down into different dimensional tables uh, fact tables and uh, so they keep breaking down breaking down breaking down uh that is your snowflake schema Right? depending on what you have. I have actually, even in uh, reality, I've not used Snowflake schema, but I've only used star schema. I have just built different star schemas, um, but depending on how you how you want it to be like it. But usually in um, interviews, you can just talk about star schema and let them know that you know Snowflake schema, um, but, uh, but that is Snowflake schema. So the logical arrangement of tables in multi-dimensional database represented by centralized fact tables and are connected to multiple dimensional tables. A complex snowflake shape emerges when the dimensions of a snowflake schema are elaborated having multiple levels of relationships, child tables having multiple pair parents. Okay. Mm, so Nigar asked, um, but transitory dependency sounds logical. How can we eliminate it? Uh, uh, so when you go over your data, when you have a data and you go over the data, you will um, see, for example, um, like the the crime the, the crime housing table itself. If you see crime housing and weather table, 
um, a crime and housing is related and crime and weather is related, but housing and uh, weather shouldn't be, housing and weather is also related, right? But uh, you should make the tables in such a way that, um, like, uh, or break the tables down in such a way that instead of just having one weather table, you can have a different table that ha has like, instead of having the weather information, this has like housing detail, like area details, because so housing table and the weather table are, are um, connected to each other based on uh, the location, right? So if you have a different location table, you can break that uh, that uh, that bond between weather table and housing table. Uh, you do that because they will sometimes will have a if they have this redundant property right this will cause havoc later on right so instead of so instead of having that uh, the location in the, both the housing table and both the weather table have lo the location information in a separate table so when you have the location information in a second a second table uh, in another table uh, that you can just um, yeah, go to that particular location table and get the location information and so this crime housing and uh, weather table will not have a cyclic redundancy, okay? It'll all be going to one. Hopefully you could, hopefully that was a good explanation. Um, you shouldn't have the cyclic redundancy. That actually always causes a problem. It'll, it'll uh, end up in a, um, uh, what is that? Um, the run condition, it'll, a run condition error, those performance errors behind the scenes, is, these kind of redundancies will always, or cause issues. So Seri asks, what's a real world example of a 3NF? Real world example. All database tables are a 3NF actually. Um, uh, we will see this 3NF in our next uh, session, uh, Sherry, uh, where we go over how to build when we are going and discussing about how to build a database, we'll go over that so that uh, that can help. Uh, that'll be like a real, because all all database tables will be in in the real world will be a three nf. They shouldn't be transitive properties uh, and should have like one nf and two nf, right? <clears throat> and okay, so uh, uh, Patty is asked. Um, are star schemas and snowflake schemas mostly used for analytics database or is it used for trans? It can be used for both, Patty. Uh, depending on what you like, you can use it for both. You can design it for an analytical database too. You can um, design it for a transaction database too. But uh, the, the difference between analytical and transaction database will come when how are you splitting the table? Uh, how, how What kind of, how you're splitting the table will become um, uh, a, a, uh, uh, this one important uh, on how we're splitting the columns and how atomic the uh, this ones are, uh, the tables are. That's when um, you can use the schema. So for both analytical and uh, transaction, you can use star schema. And Mayuri asks, can you please elaborate transitive dependency with an example? Like for like Mayuri, I said right now, right? Um, uh, the there's a crime table, there's a housing table, there's a weather table. Okay, so the crime table based on location is connected to the housing table. The crime table is also uh, uh, to, uh, connected to a housing table based on the location. And the housing table and the weather table also based on the location, they can be connected. So if you see over there, you have like a uh, cyclic uh, thing, right? Cyclic redundancy. You have a cyclic redundancy there. So you have a crime table based on location you can get it over there, right? Then you have a weather table. Based on location, you can get the weather, right? And then you have a housing table. So based on location, you can get housing also, housing information. So if you see, the three are connected. The three are connected like this. But what is the connecting agent over here is the location, right? Uh, if you get the, if you take the location out, and put that separately, and all these tables have to connect to location, they'll be have like one-to-one -one relationship with the location table, then the transitive dependency will be taken away. Uh, and so, so in order to like, uh, to um, avoid a race condition where we are always checking one another, one another, you can all take out that location information, put it separately. Like the state, the zip code, uh, uh, state zip code county and all you put in one table 
that will be like they'll separate all the information so you just have the house the house you have the house table like how many rooms are there in the house what's the uh, what's the build of the house and everything in house table in weather table is like a uh, day and the um, of the weather details how how maximum weather minimum weather you can have those tables there and the state like which location can be in the location table then crime so based on which location you can have in the crime table you can have so many uh, murders happen so many uh, thefts happen so many burglaries happen you know that the, those counts can be in the crime table and in order to do the reference you have like in the location table you'll have that uh, you can have a crime id that will reference a crime a crime ID is a foreign key that will reference a crime uh, crime table. You can have a weather ID that will reference a weather, particular weather, that location. Okay? So you'll take out that particular information and then you will um, lose a race condition over there, which could possibly occur when you have redundancy. That's why they are always try, whenever you build something, you always try to get avoid redundancy so that you can avoid a race condition. Hopefully you got that, Mayuri. Uh, so Banu was asked the question, which schema most companies use based on business requirement? Uh, uh, most companies usually have been using star schema, but now the Snowflake itself, the Snowflake company, they are really doing very good PR and marketing. So they have a very good product right now that they're trying to sell. So there's not much work behind the scenes for a data engineer. So, so they are also selling very well. But usually when you're building it as a, in a company, star schemas are always used. Okay, here I will go. What is a business process? Okay, so what is a business process? Business process is a collection of business stars activities uh, that went performed by um, people or systems in a structured course produces an outcome that contributes to the business goals. For example, if you're creating a ticketing system and the questions you want to ask, so uh, basically, uh, so what is the process, right? So uh, questions that you are, get asked would be how many tickets sold, uh, how many customers have purchased the tickets, different vendors and metrics for data for the event. These are all the questions that you're asking. And that is actually a business process behind the scenes, right? If, if whatever you do, like in Amazon, you're asking for the be best seller, um, the top rated, all this is actually a business process behind the, behind the scenes to get you that information, that process, that goes and gets that information is actually called the business process. So how many tickets were sold and that the business process behind the scene will be customer purchases ticket. You know, how many per customer purchase the ticket uh, based on that information, that's a business process for, for a company to be a business process. Uh, how many uh, um, customers purchase the tickets, uh, you know, returning tickets, canceling tickets, and then for uh, different vendors, the vendor list tickets. Those are like the business processes behind the scenes that you have. Um, if You know, like example in Amazon or in Netflix, you're saying uh, you have all these different things that come up when you watch Netflix, like uh, top rated, um, uh, the, the most watched and all that different. Those are all different, different differences, processes that actually help us get the data. So uh, behind the scenes, that is what is called a business process. Why I'm bringing in the business process is because whenever there's a question asked from for, from uh, end user, that actually transforms into a business process that actually as data engineers, we have to think about. So what is the business process this will look like, right? Uh, what are the, so based on the business process, you can, uh, you have, uh, the tables you have the uh, the tables that you use you have the schemas that you use where you'll try to figure out the transactional analytical process that you'll have to use so based on transactional analytical process then you have to build whether it's read heavy or write heavy behind the scenes you know so that that that's become a process so it may be a simple question that they're asking the end user asking but behind the scenes that uh, to deliver that result, we have this huge process that we have to think about so that we can make sure that this performance is there, um, uh, uh, integrity is there, uh, uh, the, um, you know, all that, um, there's no buffering, all that, uh, those important performance measures are taken care of. So you need to have that behind the scene process, uh, even if it looks like a simple, uh, a simple question. So those are all some, some things that you have to think about as a data engineer uh, when building systems and managing systems. You got that, hopefully. Okay. Now, now is when we are coming to data modeling. 
I'm sorry, I'm taking too long. There's so much to read. So data modeling, what is data modeling? Data modeling, abstraction that organizes elements of data and how they relate to each other. Okay. The process for creating data models for information system. Data modeling is, uh, is to organize data into a database system to ensure that your data is persisted and easily usable. Supports business and user application. Okay, data modeling is about how to structure data to be used by different people within an organization. You can think of data modeling as a process of designing data and making it available to machine learning engineers, data scientists, data business analytics, etc. So they can make use of the data easily. So basically, in short, how to efficiently make use of the data, how to efficiently give the end user you efficiently use the data to give the end user what they want with a high performance is what data modeling is all about. And all the concepts and definitions that we went over so far is to help us give that particular end user what they want and very easily they want. That is our major goal. And also making sure that the data is consistent and, and there's integrity in the data. Okay, <clears throat> why a data modeling is important because data organization is critical. If you can have all, all the data in the world, but if the data is, no, that's what they say, right? 90% of the world's data is unstructured. If you can structure that data, that is going to give us so much information, they, they say all the time. But there's so much unstructured data in the world. Uh, so that's why organization of the particular data is important because that will give us so much information, uh, or so much information that we can read from. Uh, that's why data engineering is also important. If nobody, everybody says data engineering is not important, tell them that 90% of the world's data is unstructured and you need people like data engineers to help you structure the data and so that you read into the data. So data organization is critical. Organized data can help reduce complex queries for reads and can help with faster writes. Enabling efficient retrieval, reducing redundancies, reduces storage requirements. Organized data determines later data use, helps add flexibility when more data has to be added. That's why data. So, so basically, um, uh, scalability, um, integrity, consistency, uh, transferability, uh, all this um, becomes important. And that's how, uh, that's why data modeling is important. That's why designing is important. And that's why uh, this is usually for data engineers, this, this system design or data design interview is very important. So there are different types of data, like different stages to data modeling or types, different stages to data modeling. You start with the conceptual modeling. So basically this is the beginning stage of the data modeling process. In this stage, you just have the question. You just have somebody coming to you and asking you, hey, I want a database management system. Like for example, that what we are going to look at next week, uh, I'm coming to you with a question. Um, this uh, I, I am a daycare teacher. I want to expand my business, so I want to see the data. I want to I want to create a data man based management system that will help me manage and grow my business. That that's my question. So that's just a question that I'm asking you. And as a data engineer, I would like your input. I would like your help to help me design a wonderful database management system uh, that help me uh, help me with my business. Okay. So that's the. So now we go into the stages. The first is the conceptual stage, concept modeling. Here we're not coding. We are going to talk. Okay. We're going to talk about what the data model should look like. Okay, we're going to talk about how to identify the entities, the primary keys, link, the links between the entities. Okay, it doesn't have to contain the attributes, it doesn't have to contain the columns, but what are the different tables right now? We're just talking about, hey, how are we going to design it? What kind of system you want? Do you want an analytical system or a transactional system? Um, this is something you can actually think about. This is my question to you. Uh, I also write the question there. You can think about it. What is the what? What are we looking at? Are we looking at an analytical system? Are we looking at a transaction system? Are we looking at a data lake? Are we uh, what kind of uh, tables are we going to be looking at? That's entities. What are the entities will, do you think that will help uh, that data teacher? Now the data teacher may not know all that information, but as a data engineer, you have to think about it. Uh, what will be the primary key? What will be the foreign keys? Um, now they may already have data. They may not already have data. Uh, so what? So what is the process? How are you going to think about it? What are the schemas are you thinking about? What are you guys thinking about? SAS schema, a snow schema. What are you going to place? Are you going to have a fact and dimensional table? If you have a fact and dimensional table, what is going to be a fact table? What's going to be a dimensional table? Do we need a dimensional table? Do we need a fact table? 
that's it. so that are those are things we think about this stage defines what the business what business what is the business we are interested in it is a starting point carried out by the business stakeholders that helps organize and define the business rules we should understand the business process here okay so now we so they then you can uh, you have to ask the person what are the different questions that you want to answer in a daycare okay what are you looking at um how how can you, so you may not, as a data engineer you, you may not know the business very well but as a business person they even know the business very well so you got to like talk from the data perspective you can talk to the business person and understand what the business process what they want answered what are the questions they want answered how can you help them so you need to understand the business the business processes that's something you have to do here in the conception modeling so the concept model has three main things entities are tangible and intangible project that the business wants to capture these are generally the tables of the database can be identified in a model by a rectangle that's in this one attributes represent the character characteristics of entities it can be understood in the columns of the table <clears throat> okay and the relationship so here we are trying to draw the entity diagram entity relationship diagram and when you're drawing the entity relationship diagram itself you can decide whether it's going to be a, a star schema or a snowflake schema of using how many fact tables and how many dimensional tables <clears throat> then once you have this er diagram and everything ready now we talk about the logical phase in this stage we'll define how the data model implementation will be done from the design perspective this logical stage is carried out by enhancing the concept stage by including all the column types the data types the other constraints like the foreign key constraints the not, not null constraints no no duplicate constraints all that if they exist are also identified in this stage defines how the data model will be represented irrespective of the database management system here we're not talking about the database management so we're talking not talking about coding we're still in paper and pen stage we are talking about you know how the data model is going to be uh, implemented you're going to add the attributes the constraints up until this point the data model is until this point the data model is business focused business focus completely trying to understand the business in uh, data terms in a dba terms in data management terms the logical data a model is irrespective of uh, the rdms database design requires that we find good collection of relationship schemas <clears throat> okay uh, the business decision what attribute should be recorded in the database uh, the company said decision what relationship schemas should we have and how should the attributes be distributed among the various relationship schemas um here we decide on the column names the primary keys foreign keys like i said null value constraints and also here we discuss the fact and dimension tables and the schema whether they are star schema or snowflake schema then we come into the physical model this is where we will actually implement the system in a physical database okay uh, we may not have the um uh, they here we will be like uh, what specific database management with system will use uh, how what is the gigabyte uh, that of data they'll have is it a small um, a small daycare or large daycare you know based on that why i chose the database care is question is because we're looking for a daycare for my son and i was like and the current daycare is you know has all many students has gone and the teachers looking for more uh, businesses so say like, hmm why don't we just do that as a problem problem statement help build a database management system i'm not build, helping her build it i'm just thinking this is a question for the team and it's also something i am also working on so we'll work on this together trying to understand this database management system um yeah so you know so basically the physical database this is where we start coding we create the databases we create the tables we create the columns um you know uh, if we may not have the day right now for this we don't have the data but this is where we'll build it um and sometimes even in uh, interviews this is where you can say okay we can do the you know you can build it and stuff like that um you know that's that's the physical model and those are the three different stages to data modeling conceptual logical and physical and that's where where we come to the end of our definitions and next uh, series we will go over building this uh talking through it and building this uh daycare management system that will be exercise
So we'll go over all of this, what we, all the definitions we read, all of this, and then think about how we're going to solve this problem to creating a database management uh, system, a daycare management system. Okay. So Andrew, thank you so much for this great event. Um, everyone, if you have any follow-up questions, please post them in Bye. the Slack. And yeah, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and have a great day.